If you've been following My Life in Gaming since the early days, then you know just how much we love the look and feel of old VHS tapes. You know, those old analog cassettes that had movies, shows, and other stuff on them? For my money, there's almost nothing more nostalgic than popping in the original Star Wars on VHS and watching it on a good old tube television. Since I was a kid, I've developed a sort of love and fascination for instructional and promotional VHS tapes for video games. Before the internet, these tapes were pretty much the only way of seeing a game in action. These kitschy videotapes have endured in my mind, and I've kind of made a hobby out of collecting as many as I could. So kick back and let's head back to the halcyon days of home video, and look at some classic video game VHS tapes. During the early days of this channel, long before the RGB Masterclass, the main thing that we were known for was our How to Beat series. If you didn't know, that series was directly based on a classic videotape, or rather, game tape series, from the editors at Game Players Magazine. Greetings, Game Player. You're about to learn many new skills. Are you ready? The premise was simple. You watch a playthrough of a game while a voiceover guides you through and drops hints during each segment. Sure, the tips were fairly generic, and mostly embarrassingly obvious. Dodge this thing, attack that enemy, but that was half the fun. Even as a kid, I knew it was silly. To defeat the first super warrior, use jumping spin kicks. When he raises his arms, he'll shoot fire, so back off quickly. Each volume of this series covered at least four games and ran around 40 minutes. The series ran from 1989 through 1990 and consisted of 14 tapes. Most covered a variety of popular titles like Mega Man 2, Shoot the Lobster for Extra Life, and be whoever has the least energy so he gets more energy. Ninja Gaiden, Now You Must Face Jockeo. Here's how our ninja does it. And Castlevania. These games contain a lot of information. You may want to take notes on what you discover. Some of the later ones followed specific themes such as Konami and Acclaim games. There was even one all about the Power Glove. Now, let's go into the Game Player's Laboratory. We'll see how one of the Game Player's professional game testers uses the Power Glove. All these games work really well with the Power Glove. Watch how our expert player uses the glove to help him win. I gotta be honest, I absolutely love these tapes. I used to buy them as a way to kind of experience certain games I'd probably never have a chance to play myself. For around 15 bucks, you get to see a game in action and essentially experience a complete playthrough. All in all, it was a pretty good bang for your buck, especially since I'd watched them over and over again. Welcome to the third stage. The party wagon is the only way to travel and the only way to blast through the roadblocks. Now, Game Players Magazine wasn't exactly the best magazine on the market. There were tons of others I'd pick over it, but this added a whole new dimension to the material that was primarily lifted from their strategy sections. There's so many quirks to the production of these tapes that I can't help but to find them incredibly endearing. Like how the voiceover occasionally mispronounces certain words. Dodge the statactitas. The fun names that they come up with for items. Also, don't overlook the ugly stick. It's a valuable weapon. Move over to this tree and you've got it made. I just can't help it. I love them, except the segments where they use slow motion for the entire game. Just skip those. Maybe it's weird, but over time, I've developed a deep sense of nostalgia specifically for these tapes, especially for the narrator. Over the last few years, I've spent more time than I'd like to admit trying to figure out exactly who this person was. In fact, back when our How to Beat Shovel Knight episode got picked up by a number of websites, it was shared by Chris Slate, a former editor for Game Players Magazine. As it turned out, he was the one playing the games on these tapes. I figured that since I had his attention, I may as well ask him if he remembered who the voiceover guy was. But all he seemed to recall was that he was a DJ in North Carolina at the time. Game Players Magazine was based out of North Carolina, after all. About a year later, I got a random lead from someone who thought that they knew who it was. A voice actor by the name of Neil Ross, who's done a bunch of work. Most prominently as the Codex in Mass Effect 3. 
So I booted that up and wow, this has got to be him, right? In recent years, the pro-human syndicate known as Cerberus has seen its influence grow galaxy-wide. While preparing for this episode, I decided to contact Mr. Ross directly to see if I can confirm his participation. This was it. After all these years, this burning question would finally be answered. It didn't take long before I heard back. The answer was short and to the point. He said, I have absolutely no memory of having worked on game tapes for Game Players Magazine. I can see where someone might mistake it for the 80s version of me, but it's not. I have no idea who it is, and I've never set foot in North Carolina. Man, that sucks, right? Maybe one day I'll find out who it actually was. Anyways, the Game Players game tapes were my first introduction to video game VHS tapes. I've kind of made it a goal to collect all of them. At this point in time, I've obtained nine of them. Hopefully someday I'll be able to lay claim to the rest. Your supplies are depleted when you meet Zur, the last Xantho Lord, but you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain by fighting him. Use your remaining Megaton bombs freely and remember what you learned battling the other Xantho Lords. In the early 1990s, you couldn't look at anything video game related without getting knocked over the head by Capcom's juggernaut Street Fighter 2. As the SNES version released, the updated Championship Edition was already in arcades, with hyper fighting right around the corner. When Capcom announced that they were not only bringing Street Fighter 2 Special Championship Edition to the Genesis, but that they'd also be releasing an updated version on the SNES, they knew that they had some work ahead of them in order to convince fans that they needed a new version. People loved the game, but did they love it enough to buy it again? To do this, they mailed out a quintessentially 90s promotional videotape to fans to spread the word. One for the Genesis, and another for the SNES. I have the Genesis version right here. Hey, you've been specially chosen to see some really important advanced news. Not only are you going to get a sneak preview, but you'll be getting strategies, tips, and techniques on some of the coolest new moves in the Street Fighter II Special Champion Edition for the Sega Genesis. This cool dude takes you inside of an arcade to meet some kids who have some very authentic reactions to Street Fighter II. Did you see that new move? Whoa! Oh, that was bad! It's great to see some footage from the heyday of arcades, but I don't think for a second that these kids are actually even playing Street Fighter II. The color and graphics are excellent. Yeah, she's so fast, I've played every day. This is the best. I've played every chance I can. So tell me, what's so special about this new version? Special Champion Edition featured all the sound effects and even more crowd noise and realistic Street Fighter sound than the arcade version. <laughs> if you say so. Actually, it's funny that the first reason he gives to prove his point is the sound quality of the Genesis version. Now when your fireball hits your opponent, he's toast. They don't even use the actual sound effects from the game when telling you this, because they know it's not true at all. The Genesis version sound is awful. Now watch the Special Champion Edition action. In the strategy segment, you'll learn how to do some special moves that, let's be honest, you probably already know these. He does call Ryu, Ru, which is almost correct. One in Ken and Ru's most famous moves is the air hurricane kick. And here's the move. Make Ken and Ru jump. Then, while in midair, in one continuous motion, push the joystick down, down backward, backward, then quickly hit any kick button. Probably the best part of this tape is the international television commercials. These things are great, and man, <laughs> Guile is jacked. The tape wraps up with a couple more commercials. One for the Street Fighter tabletop game. Can you come back from Sonic Boom? And the other for a Tiger handheld version. Let me tell you, this commercial goes all in on the hilariously awful US character artwork that I don't think anyone liked. Man, <laughs> this kills me. You say you want to be a street fighter. You're no street fighter. Not until you master the six world warriors of the Street Fighter 2 handheld game. I'm not sure how much of an impact these tapes had on fans, but both the Genesis and SNES versions went on to do well enough that Capcom was confident enough to bring the third version, Super Street Fighter 2, home. This tape is a great way to go back to the days when Street Fighter 2 ruled arcades and home consoles. There'll always be one company to go to for serious fighting games, because when it comes to great games, one company is to totally awesome. 
A while back, when I was just starting to digitize VHS tapes for this episode, my life and gaming viewer Matt Fowler sent a number of tapes my way that I'd never seen before. Chief among these were three TurboGrafx-16 promo VHS tapes that are flat out amazing. First, this TurboGrafx-16 Power Up promo gives an overview of the entire product line. This is a pretty standard promo tape, covering a bunch of games and platforms in a longer than expected 18 minute runtime. At the time this promo video was released, the TurboGrafx-16 was clearly struggling in the US, retailing for just $99.99 and included the best Bonk game, Bonk's Revenge, as the package. Go bonkers with bigger, badder bosses, more powerful power-ups, and pre-hysterical action that'll have you cracking up. The CD-ROM add-on, which had just gotten a price drop to $149, is also showcased. We get to see this kid enjoying it and its many features against a background that puts the Save by the Bell intro to shame. Harness the power of TurboGrafx-16 system for yourself and power up! It, it doesn't get better than this. The Turbo Express also gets a quick mention, although no price is revealed. This thing was always expensive, so it makes sense that they wouldn't want to draw attention to it. The Turbo Tap and Super CD-ROM upgrade also gets a little love before we get this bomb dropped on us. With the Turbo Duo, you can play standard Turbo Chip and 1 megabit CDs as well as 2 megabit games. At $299.99, Turbo Duo is the ultimate machine. With the ultimate game offer, two free CDs and a Turbo Chip game, five separate games at a value of $250, and you won't believe what's included. Man. The Turbo Duo came with so much stuff. This deal is incredible. I don't even think that Sega, at their most desperate with the Saturn, even managed to top this deal. Needless to say, if I'd seen this promo as a kid, I bet I would have ended up with a Turbo Duo. Next is a promo tape for Lords of Thunder, one of the system's defining shooters. This tape runs seven minutes and feels more like a home video than a promotional tool. I bet money that it was shot in a day and edited VCR to VCR in someone's bedroom. It almost has a 80s style skateboarding video feel to it. All the tape is is raw game footage interspersed with sound bites from people that are playing it, shop owners, and people who have no idea what Lords of Thunder even is. What do you, what do you like about Lords of Thunder? The lyrics. The lyrics? Huh? The credit says it's a Rod Soldier Productions, but I couldn't find any info on who or what that was. Maybe it was a kid in his bedroom living with his parents. I'd have done it for a Turbo Duo in Lords of Thunder. What do you think of Lords of Thunder? It's my favorite game. In fact, ever since my baby's been born, that's all I do. The third tape, Turbo Duo Power, is almost exactly the same as the Duo segment in the first promo tape. The main difference being that the pack-in is now Ninja Spirit instead of Dungeon Explorer. The Ninja Action Classic packed with fantastic graphics and bold background. Probably the most interesting point is the mail order offer where owners of the Turbo CD could send away for a super system card or get a deal that included the card and some games for $95. It's called the Super System Card and it's your ticket to a new world of gaming excitement. Add the upgrade card to your TurboGrafx CD system and suddenly you've got Power Plus. I'm not really sure how these TurboGrafx tapes were distributed whether they were played in retail shops, sent to fans, or appeared in kiosks. Promo videos don't get better than this. The greatest video game I ever seen. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the fourth and final tape that Matt sent me, the Sega Saturn US launch promo tape. You are approaching Saturn. You are only seconds away. I have arranged for you to meet my companion. He will lead you. Watch and listen. Please don't disappoint him. He doesn't like that. This nine minute promo tape takes us through a bunch of weird vignettes hosted by a really intense bald floating head, who, let's be honest, is kind of scary. Oh yeah, there's also bodybuilders, bikers and tutus, and a guy in a crazy hat. Sega Saturn, the most powerful, the most technologically advanced game system anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Weird imagery aside, it's the actual editing of this promo that makes it practically unwatchable. I knew that Sega had to fight to get people's attention, but this definitely did more harm than good. 
Once we arrive at the theater of the eye segment, we get a chance to witness, in real time, a person's insides going crazy at the sight of what the Sega Saturn was capable of, culminating with... What else can go wrong? Surgeon Synapse on line two, it's the sphincter. What is going on up there? <sighs> Forget it. As hard as this is for me to say, and how much I love the Saturn, Sega probably got what they deserve launching with this promo. Sega! Saturn! Other than the game player's game tapes, I'd always seem to see this tape at the video store. Secret video game tricks, codes, and strategies. What an awesome cover, right? This hour-long, Nintendo-focused tape was written and produced by Steve Harris the very same Steve Harris who would go on to create the legendary video game publication, Electronic Gaming Monthly. On this tape, you get your secret game tricks, codes, and strategies delivered directly by three members of the U.S. National Video Game Team. This group of professional gamers that was originally founded by Walter Day of Twin Galaxies fame helped lay a bit of the groundwork for the esports scene of today. So what's the actual video like? Well, you get tips and tricks for 26 games, which are mostly pretty simple, like 30 lives in Contra. For 30 men in Contra, before the music starts, put in this code. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. Double Dragon, which was clearly the hot game at the time, gets the most coverage. In fact, there's a 15 minute segment that shows a complete playthrough of the final level, including both boss fights. Man, this part goes on forever. Probably my favorite part of this tape, besides their liberal use of PVMs throughout, is the outtakes that play over the ending credits. This isn't right, because I didn't, I just gotta, done, I didn't go all the way up the wall. The secret video game tricks, codes, and strategy series span three volumes, although I've never seen any beyond the first one. I'm curious if the production style of them got better in following tapes. When you've lost your last man, Hold A and B to continue where you left off. Do this before the title screen appears. October 4th, 1994. I'll never forget coming home from school that day with a copy of Jurassic Park on VHS that had just been released that day. In my mailbox was this, Donkey Kong Country Exposed. I have no idea how Nintendo got my address to send this to me. It's not like I was a Nintendo Power subscriber or anything but it sure made a heck of a decision of what to watch first. Nintendo's whole Play It Loud ad campaign was in full swing by this point, showing that it wasn't just Sega that could be in your face and edgy. I'd seen some screenshots of DKC that had me impressed, but seeing this game in motion really made me a believer. Our host, this dude, takes us inside of Nintendo of America to ask the hard questions. What's Donkey Kong Country all about, and where can we see it? Guys, we finally made it. Nintendo of America, the fortress. Let's find out what Donkey Kong Country is all about. Let's go inside. To a kid like me, it was super cool getting to see the inside of the mythical Nintendo US headquarters, even if the host was kind of embarrassing himself at every opportunity. Oh yeah, most of the tape is done with this super ugly color effect, so get used to it. It's Ken, Ken Lobb, development manager. Hey man, how's it going? Donkey Kong Country, how you doing? We meet up with Ken Lobb, then development manager at Nintendo, who takes us to the Nintendo Treehouse. Okay, I'll take you to the Treehouse. The Treehouse? Gotta hope there's no climbing involved. I gotta say, I had no idea that the Treehouse was ever talked about before Nintendo started doing their E3 live shows. Here it is. What's the password? Diddy. Password? Diddy? Yeah! <laughs> In addition to Ken Lobb, we meet a bunch of different people working on Donkey Kong Country like some game testers and Dan Osen. This is Dan Osen. Oh, hey. Dan! What's up? How are you? Pretty good. Good, Dan, I want to know something about this story. Basically, we uh, had a chance to kind of create a new story for Donkey Kong. We gave him a world to live in, some supporting characters. After that, we hear a phone call from Rare's co-founder, Tim Stamper, who gives some insight to how they got the characters to look like they did. I was just curious as to how you made them look so real. Because we're based in Twycross, we have a zoo about two miles away. Ah, uh, you went to the zoo. Went to the zoo, yeah, and had a, a good look at the gorillas and the monkeys and with video cameras. It was pretty funny. What's weird is that this is the only time that Rare is mentioned in the whole video. Even during the soundtrack segment, there isn't even a single muttering of David Wise. Because the music is so good, we're putting this music on a CD. You know, something that's big in Japan for many, many years is game music on CD. 
hasn't been a big hit in America because maybe the music hasn't been quite up to what you hear on the on the radio is every daytime you're kind of losing it, dude. The DKC exposed tape ends with a post credit stinger that teases the then unseen killer instinct when the host walks into a room he's not supposed to be in. Let's see what's in here. Hey guys, can I play? With one-on-one -on -one fighting games at the height of their popularity, it was kind of neat to see that Nintendo was getting involved. This also served as a teaser for what we could expect from their still in development Ultra 64 hardware. I'll tell you what. You better reserve this game before November 21st, because that's when it comes out in the stores. I already got mine. The goal of this tape was to sell Donkey Kong Country. They knew that when people saw it in motion, they were going to be blown away, because screenshots only tell half the story. Needless to say, it worked for me, and I ended up getting the game that Christmas. Obviously, I wasn't the only one. Unfortunately, this was the only tape I ever received from Nintendo in the mail. As quickly as I was put on their mailing list, I was removed from it. Thankfully, Try has a whole bunch of tapes that followed. Well, it'd still be a few more years before I got on Nintendo's mailing list, but I've still checked out some of their earlier tapes. I've always thought of Yoshi's Island as kind of a landmark game for me. I was 11 years old, and it's the first game I remember getting myself caught up in the pre-release hype. I saw a video of it in the kiosk at Toys R Us, and it just blew me away. I think some of the gameplay clips in that trailer are also on this tape. Introducing the game you've been waiting four long years to play, Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, available only on Super NES, a game like you've never played before. That dude from the Donkey Kong Country tape is back to tell us all about how bad and rad the long-awaited sequel to Super Mario World is. It's not quite as play it loud as the DKC tape, but still, it's just funny to watch them flail about trying to market a cute Japanese game with crayon artwork to an American audience. The graphics of the game are cool. Yeah. And when we made Yoshi's Island, they wanted to have a different look. You know, so they, they do something that almost looked like a sketch. They're kind of like hand drawn. I think that was the look that, that they were going for when they designed Yoshi's Island. The scope of the video is definitely scaled back a bit from the Donkey Kong Country tape, but it's still a good look at how Nintendo of America pushed the SNES, leading into its final year as their flagship console. Hold on, big boy. Uh, where am I? Well, you've entered the world of Nintendo. What am I doing here? In order to learn all the secrets about this game, you're gonna have to journey through Yoshi's Island. So, uh, which way do I go? You're gonna go that way. That way? Yes. All right, thanks. I didn't get my SNES until 1994, so I was actually a bit apprehensive about Nintendo replacing it just two short years later. Until I played the N64 for myself in Toys R Us in September 1996, I had no idea just how much it would consume me. But maybe if I'd seen this launch tape sooner, I'd have been on board from the beginning. This is it, the power of N64 the driving force in the next generation of video games. With 64-bit technology, you're a witness to moves and graphics that no other system can match. 360-degree viewing, three-dimensional graphic interpretations, anti-aliasing for crisp graphics, and too many other things that are just going to blow your mind. It starts off showing some news clips of the launch lines in Japan. Then we go to Nintendo of America and it's this sort of weird dark vibe for the rest of the video. These three kids, supposedly some of the nation's top gamers, who I don't quite buy as being real people, not actors, come to get a first look at the N64. So, I understand you're here to find out about the Nintendo 64. Ken Lobb shows off the refined controls in Super Mario 64, and there are all of these obnoxious reaction cuts and these kids making some dumb remarks. Oh, did you see that? Yo, you see the way he went to that door? I'm kidding. Yeah, Mario's got those mad door walking through skills. Anyway, the video goes on to look at Pilot Wing 64 and Star Wars Shadows of the Empire. Oh, I love that part. I wish this video did more for me, but it's just full of unpleasing cuts and not enough fun. But the coolest thing is that we get to see some early versions of games like Star Fox 64, Body Harvest, and what used to be called Mario Kart R. But most interesting of all is Kirby's Air Ride, which released seven years later for the GameCube. N64 rules. 
On September 29th, N64 will be released in limited quantities. The first tape that I personally received as a Nintendo Power subscriber was for Star Fox 64. I had actually never played the first Star Fox at the time because a friend of mine said he hated it. But this fine piece of marketing material got both of us immediately excited for Star Fox 64. Nintendo employee Peter skydives into work only to be jumped by thugs from Sony and Sega and taken in for interrogation. They want to know all about this new game, Star Fox 64. Unable to watch them torture a Mario doll, Peter talks. Or else, plumber boy here gets <laughs> What are you guys doing with Mario? <laughs> no! Leave Mario out of this. <laughs> Start talking. Okay, okay, okay. You've made your point. All this awesome footage about the Star Fox team and their vehicles is more than enough to sell you on the game, but to learn more, the thugs have to capture Bob from the R&D department. Pizza for Bob. Are you, uh, Bob? Yeah, but, uh, I didn't order any pizza. <laughs> Bob reveals the Rumble Pack, a mind-blowing concept on home consoles at the time, and the Sony and Sega guys don't believe it at all until they try it for themselves. Whoa! I actually felt it. I told you. And when you get hit by enemy fire, you feel even more of a vibration. <gasps> <laughs> After getting a bit chummy and playing some four-player Star Fox 64, they roll a sizzle reel full of upcoming N64 games. This totally blew my mind at the time. Mischief Makers in particular stood out to me because it was such a novelty to see 2D gameplay on the N64. What? <laughs> you mean there's more? <laughs> yup, check this out! But looking back, it's also really cool to see levels that never made it into the final version of Yoshi's story and prototype footage of Zelda 64, none of which exists in Ocarina of Time. Boy, are we in big trouble. <laughs> this video is just so much fun. Easily my favorite video game marketing tape ever, and I watched it over and over again as an impressionable 13 year old. I love how it captures that particular era of Nintendo versus Sega rivalry with newcomer Sony. It really is one of the last remnants of an era when Nintendo competed so confidently and so directly with its rivals. Thanks for the pizza, guys. See you later, boys. <laughs> the second VHS I got from Nintendo Power was for Diddy Kong Racing. The N64 had received some high profile delays and Diddy Kong Racing was officially announced only months before its November 97 release. So I saw it as kind of swooping in to save Nintendo's holiday season. The recent whereabouts of Diddy Kong have been a mystery. Until now. To get the story, we sent world famous adventurer and thrill seeker Dirk Monahan to catch up with the elusive chimp. Now Dirk has run with the bulls of Pamplona and braved the raging waters of the Amazon in nothing more than an inner tube. He eats danger with a spoon, wipes his chin and asks for seconds. Dirk. Can you hear me? All right. It's framed up as kind of a bad news program called Hot Topic, and I always saw this as a hugely disappointing follow-up to the Star Fox 64 tape. One thing that's kind of odd is that they keep trying to frame up Diddy as a monkey gone wild and that participating in this bright and colorful racing adventure is extremely dangerous. It appears that Diddy Kong will also be racing new and different vehicles in this adventure, specifically hovercraft. That's right, hovercraft and planes will also be available. This is racing like we've never seen before, Trent. Even head-to-head -head and versus mode, players can race different combinations of vehicles. Ultimately, the Diddy Kong Racing Tape gave a pretty good overview of a game that I already wanted to get, but it wasn't exactly something that I watched over and over again. It didn't help that the closing hype reel is composed of games that had already been out for a while, which left me with little to feel excited about. We know you've got the inside tips, Daryl. That's all we want. What about the turbo? All right, all right, all right. When you hit a turbo, let the boost fizzle out before you press the A button. If you press A, you'll cut off any boost you have going. And the power-ups? You people are vultures! 
Uh, <clears throat> little help? Nintendo wanted to improve its mainstream appeal with the in-sports branding for N64 sports titles, and this tape was sent out to promote it. It's a pretty straightforward video, nothing elaborate like the previous tapes. Okay, listen up, sports fans. Time to strap in and turn the page, because this is a preview of the season's most epic sports experience. Interesting to see the use of the word epic in a time from before it hit such a level of saturation that you can't say it anymore. But anyway, I'm not much of a sports guy, so I don't want to say too much about this video because my thoughts on it are pretty irrelevant. I always have had a soft spot for 1080 snowboarding, though. It's all here, and it's only on Nintendo Sports, with gameplay so real. It damn near hurts. Leading up to its release in June 1998, Nintendo sent out a tape to promote Banjo-Kazooie. As a huge Rare fan, I was already pretty hyped for it, but getting a closer look at the game in action was certainly appreciated. This time, there's absolutely no story or framing device. This is even simpler than the in-sports tape, consisting almost entirely of straight-up gameplay clips with voiceover. So what's the big deal? Well, listen up, because there's a new dynamic duo from the creators of Donkey Kong Country and GoldenEye that's ready to kick some serious excitement into Nintendo 64. It's Banjo-Kazooie! I thought it kind of sounded like Charles Martinet, but people who are way better at identifying celebrities than me seem to be certain it's John Lovitz. Perhaps the most interesting thing about the tape is that it starts off with a Nintendo and Rareware logo sequence that is similar, but definitely different from the one that appears in the final game. The video drags a bit when it dedicates a significant amount of time to showcasing every single level in the game. Treasure Trove Cove. Forget your beach towel, because this world is no place to get a tan, as our heroes soon realize exploring Treasure Troll Cove. Thankfully, Nintendo brought their A game with the preview reel, this time actually showing off a bunch of games that weren't out yet. What a difference one year made for Ocarina of Time, this time featuring scenes from the final release. Check it out now at your nearest Nintendo retailer. Don't delay, or you might be the one left standing there with egg on your face! These days, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and college kids have all known their whole lives what Pokemon is, but I had just barely started high school when the series hit America. Me being a lifelong Nintendo freak, I was already really curious, but most of my peers assumed it was just kitty garbage. This sneak peek VHS tape, for better or worse, focuses on Pokemon as a massive multimedia empire invading America with the TV show, the toys, the Tamagotchi-type Pikachu thing, and hardly anything about the Game Boy game at all. And that's not all. This is Pocket Pikachu. <laughs> I can exercise with it, give it gifts, even watch it sleep. I know there are 150 Pokemon out there, but is there really one more adorable than Pikachu? <laughs> Due to this sort of marketing, I think a lot of people my age were annoyed by the whole thing and never gave the game a chance. But it's really interesting seeing this sort of pre-release confidence in the franchise's Western prospects, which has incredibly endured for around two decades without letting up. Catch em, catch em, gotta catch The last tape I ever received from Nintendo Power, and as far as I know, the last tape they ever sent out, is called Hot News 64. Welcome, you lucky, lucky game freaks. I'm Steve Sobel, and this is a very special edition of Nintendo's Hot News 64, the all-you-can-eat buffet of insider news on the hottest game system in history, and I guess I must be talking about N64! <laughs> right on, right on. This is a much more straightforward news style program than the hot topic from the Diddy Kong Racing video, but it features this host that I always found to be kind of obnoxious. It was fun seeing Nintendo take jabs at Sega and Sony in 1997, but coming from 1999, it feels a bit pathetic. Or maybe it's just the way this guy says it. 
Well, the other guys are going like, hey, Nintendo, hey, can I be like you? Wait, hey, let me catch up. You want to go get a soda or something? Sorry, guys. N64's always got the games, and I'm here to prove it. Still, in a way, it almost feels like the first Nintendo Direct if you really think about it. The primary purpose of this tape is, yet again, to promote some upcoming titles by Rare. It's really reflective of just how much Nintendo counted on Rare's games at the time. Jet Force Gemini gets a great trailer with music and sound effects, followed by some extra footage with informational voiceover. Now, what makes Gemini such an original? Talk to us, Trav. Take us inside. Well, Jet Force Gemini is a game that follows in the footsteps of the very best that the N64 has to offer. Games like GoldenEye, games like Turok the Dinosaur Hunter, it has a terrific near first person perspective that really serves to pull you into the game. And with 120 stages, you're gonna be there a while. Again, kind of a bit like a Nintendo Direct. Donkey Kong 64 gets the same treatment. Throughout the video, we get a few cheats and tips from Dan Osen, probably the most well-known Nintendo of America staffer at the time. It feels a bit silly providing secret tips on tape during the era of Cheat Code Central, though. Well, Link One, if you're the Link that Dan thinks you are, you should know better than to ask. But here's a hot tip for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. The hype reel at the end does disappoint a bit. It doesn't show as many clips from each game as previous reels, and the overall selection of games featured just aren't necessarily the most exciting in retrospect. Okay. That's it for this special edition of Nintendo's Hot News 64. I've never been much of a car fan, but during the N64 days, I did for whatever reason gravitate toward renting a semi-realistic racing game every now and then. Top Gear Rally always stood out in my mind as one of the better ones I tried, and it actually holds up pretty okay with a smoother frame rate than your average N64 title. It's an American tradition that goes back centuries. So, in the spirit of getting ahead, Top Gear Rally is proud to offer you a variety of shortcuts on every track to shave a little time and put you in command. A while back, My Life in Gaming's first ever subscriber and our good friend Sobo gave me this Top Gear Rally VHS tape. I'm not too sure how it was originally distributed, but it contains, as you'd expect, a promotional pitch for Top Gear Rally. It's overall pretty straightforward, though I have to say I'm surprised just how much bad driving made the cut. I mean, this ain't burnout. The end of the tape has a few trailers for other Midway games like Sub-Zero, and even a bunch of games that weren't for N64 at all. The late 90s and early 2000s were an interesting time for Ubisoft. I saw them as kind of being an up and coming underdog, making some of the more interesting games out there, while today they're pretty firmly established as a AAA heavyweight targeting mass market appeal. This tape looks at three Ubisoft titles for N64, starting with Rayman 2. It's just a simple overview with voiceover, but it does a good job of making me want to replay it. Great game with a great style. And it's nice that it also includes the TV commercial for the archivists out there. So, remember, it's Rayman, not Ray. Rayman 2 for Nintendo 64. Tonic Trouble is a game that I forgot existed until very recently. It's definitely the sort of game that I'd have grabbed at the rental store, but never did. I've never heard anyone bring it up and speak of it with fond nostalgia, but I think it looks decent enough. It also includes the TV commercial, which I don't ever remember seeing. So there you have it. Proof positive that Tonic Trouble for Nintendo 64 is, that's right, a lot of fun. The last game on the tape is Rocket Robot on Wheels, the first game developed by Sucker Punch who went on to make Sly Cooper and Infamous. This is a game that I picked up not too long ago, but I haven't had a chance to play through it yet. The overview here makes it look really amazing though, tons of variety, so maybe I should make it a priority. Build towering roller coasters and take them for a ride. The tape finishes with a preview for the Rayman animated series, another thing I forgot about existing. There's no reason to worry. It's a big city. We'll blend right in. Is he done? Man, 
That was a lot of tapes. As a kid, I bought all the game magazines. EGM, Game Fan, Video Games and Computer Entertainment, Game Players, and Game Pro. Game Pro was fairly kid-friendly, so it made a lot of sense when they announced that they were making a TV show out of the magazine. Game Pro TV premiered in 1990, but as quickly as it appeared, it disappeared from my local stations. The only resource that exists for Game Pro TV today are people that manage to hang on to their broadcast recordings. However, Game Pro did release a rentable VHS tape that compiled all the tips, tactics, and code segments from the main show exclusively to video stores. I just have volume one here. Yo, hey, I'm down here, over here. See, I figured if you want to get the news, you might as well get right into the best place to find it. So, here I am, right in the middle of the pages of Game Pro Magazine, the number one source for home and arcade video game information. The show was hosted by then hot TV personality J.D. Roth and a surfer dude, Brennan. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Game Pro. I'm J.D. Roth. And I'm Brennan. What's up, pal? What's up, How's buddy? Going? What? Game Pro TV did a great job of bringing the look and feel of the magazine to TV. After a while, Brennan was dropped with Roth taking over full duties for the remainder of the series, including this tape. Hanging out amongst the pages of the magazine gives the creator an excuse to just go nuts with a green screen tech. Sure, it's pretty cheesy, but it's very apparent that they had a lot of fun making this stuff. Hey, hey, hey. Since everyone seems to be having such a good time with Krusty's Super Funhouse for the Genesis, we thought we'd give you another password tip. The tape itself, named after the code section from the magazine, features the mother load of tips, tricks, and runs a staggering 45 minutes. There's a ton of games covered here with less popular and mainstream stuff featured side by side. There's also some user submission codes as well, and it must have been fun for a lot of these people to show up on the show. I wonder where Daniel Warren is these days. Super Nintendo Game Joe and Mac. I had recordings of Game Pro TV a long time ago, but they ended up in the trash at some point. Thankfully, a number of them have been posted on YouTube for people to enjoy. There's another tape that I've never seen, but none of the full episodes have seen any sort of release. Sure, Game Pro TV may not have set the world on fire, but it was certainly enough to get a 12-year-old Corey out of bed before the sun came up on the weekends. Well, that about wraps it up for this videotaped installment of Game Pro. So until next time, keep those thumbs exercised, and remember, when you need to know what's happening in the world of home and arcade video games, pick up a Game Pro magazine, the number one source of gamer information. See you next time. Oh man, <laughs> now we're talking. The how to score more points in Nintendo games instructional video series from Kodak Home Video are by far the best how to win tapes I've ever seen. And when I say best, I mean the worst, in the best way. Are you ready to win at your favorite Nintendo games? Imagine the power you have when you know the secret paths and you've seen how to score more points. But before we get to the realest tips and tactics you've ever heard, we gotta check out some trailers for Codex's other instructional tapes, such as the incredible Just Say Yo. The Yo-Yo Man instructional video, a great gift idea from Kodak Video Programs. Join the fun, just say yo. As the main show begins, I see a familiar name. Turns out these tapes were produced and directed by Seth Godin in 1989. If you don't know who that is, well, he would go on to publish The Worlds of Power Books, which were NES game novelizations. I've done episodes on them. Check them out. After the credits, we meet our host. Skip. Actually, I'll let him do the introduction. Hi, my name is Skip Rogers, World, World Video, Video Game, game Champion. Champion. Whew, this tape is a bit rough around the edges. It'll walk you through five games. Well, that might be giving old Skip a bit too much credit. These tips make what we heard on the Game Player game tapes sound like super plays. There's some really hilarious gems here, almost all totally worthless. Landing is the hardest part of the game. Even Skip Rogers misses a landing now and then. The white dot on the map shows you where you are. The red dot gives you your destination. But my main question is, who is Skip Rogers? I don't know, that sounds like a fake name to me. World video game champion? That sounds like a lie too. Besides, if he really was the world video game champion, how come he needs gameplay consultants? How come his gameplay tips suck? Hey Skip, do you have any hot strategies for Blaster Master? 
Shoot them as they come around the corner. Avoid the lava pits. Grab the lightning pill. It will increase your firepower. All right, all right, right. Maybe I'm a bit harsh on old Skip. I mean, I've definitely gotten more than my 99 cents worth of enjoyment out of these tapes. Unfortunately, I don't think that any more were produced beyond these two. I wonder where Skip is these days, if he was real. Kids ask me what kind of joystick I use. When you play all day, you need a stick that's comfortable and stands up to a lot of gameplay. That's why I like the Ultimate Remote from Bishu. As a special bonus, you can call Bishu and they'll send you a brochure and a special note from me, Skip Rogers, World, World Video, Video Game, Game Champion. Champion. The final tape that I own is also the newest. Squaresoft on PlayStation Collector's VHS arrived in late 1997, well after Final Fantasy VII had taken the world by storm and effectively made RPGs a thing for the masses in the US. Squaresoft obviously wanted to capitalize on the success by letting people know about their upcoming games, but first, some Final Fantasy VII content. Man, these trailers still get me hyped. There's also some great interviews with Hironobu Sakaguchi, Yoshinori Katase, and Nobuo Uematsu that don't exactly shine a light on the development of the game, but it's nice to revisit a time when these guys were working together regularly. A larger developing team will not always create a better game. But when a project moves onto a scale such as this, you get to spend a lot of money and work with a highly qualified staff. Following the interviews is around four minutes of game trailers that gave us a look at some of Squaresoft's early PS1 offerings like Bushido Blade, Final Fantasy Tactics, and Saga Frontier. I remember it being so surreal that all these games were coming after how few Squaresoft games had been released in the previous years on the SNES. The final inclusions are a trio of TV commercials for Final Fantasy VII that brought the series to mainstream audiences with all its shiny CG cutscenes. These trailers hold up so well today, signifying the beginning of Squaresoft's golden age. Man, what a time it was to be an RPG fan. They said it couldn't be done in a major motion picture. They were right. Final Fantasy VII. Talk about a lot of videotapes, right? Would you believe that we actually didn't cover everything that we have? Stuff like a Howard Johnson's Game Gear tape and a Fuse video magazine that didn't make this episode, but will hopefully be featured in the future. And hey, this isn't even talking about all the Japanese exclusive tapes that are out there. If you enjoyed these videotapes and would like to watch them in their entirety, we've uploaded all of them and more to our side channel, Video Game B-Roll. We launched that channel as a way to put archival materials, such as raw video game footage and tapes like these, up for everyone to enjoy in the best possible quality. So head over there and get ready for hours upon hours of video game VHS tapes. In my mailbox with this.